a, an excerpt from a novel, and uh, it's about a black family in the early 1990s who moves to the Berkshires to take part in an experiment where they're raising their nine and 13-year-old daughters with a chimpanzee. So this is a scene when the, they first meet the chimpanzee, and it's um, their oldest daughter explaining what happens. <coughs> Charo's room was connected to our apartment by a door in the living room. Dr. Paulson pulled the key for it out of her pocket, but stopped herself, thought better of it before she put it in the lock. She handed the key to my mother so that she could be the one to open the door. The room was large and bare, oval shaped with low ceilings. There was no furniture anywhere. Instead, there were bundles of pastel colored blankets heaped on the scarred wood floor. Even from where I stood, I could see the blankets were the scratchy kind, the leave on them too rough. Around the room were pots of plants. Most of them held mundane ferns, the kind that were used in the dentist's office. Dr. Paulson explained later that these were to simulate the natural world, the wide open forest Charo presumably pined for without it even seeing them. Charo sat beside one of the pots, pulling a long fern stem towards his nose. He was not alone. Beside him sat a man in blue jeans and a t-shirt, his lab coat balled up in a corner. Every time Charo managed to pull a fern to the tip of his nose, the man would break off a leaf from another part of the plant and tickle it around Charo's ears and under his chin, trying to distract him. That's Max, my assistant, Dr. Paulson said. They're playing. It just looked annoying to me, but Charo didn't seem to mind, only shook his head at the TV and kept his gaze focused on the green between his fingers. Dr. Paulson called Max and the man put down the leaves. Then he picked Charo up and brought him over to us. He still looked like a baby. Taped to his waist was a plastic bag printed with the biohazard symbol. Through the three interlocking circles, I could see a crop of white hair sprouting from his behind. Regular diapers don't fit him properly, Dr. Paulson said. My father went to him first, rubbing the top of Charo's head gently, trying not to scare him. Next, my sister Callie, who smiled and smiled, trying to get him to bare his teeth back. Then it was my turn. I reached out my hand to touch him. I thought he would be bristly and sharp like a cat, but his hair was fine. It was almost unbearably soft. I could feel at its downy ends a quiver of heat from the yellow expanse of skin that shone beneath his fur. I pulled my hand away qu quickly. Last was my mother, who was crying now, who said through tears, he's so beautiful. I wanted to say something snide. I wanted to say what I had been saying since she told us about this experiment, that this was crazy, that she was crazy. But I looked into my mother's wet face, wide open with joy, and I couldn't help myself. I said, yes, he is. At dinner, I sat beside Dr. Paulson. Our plates were full of cold, milky, milky beef stroganoff from the Institute cafeteria, but it didn't really matter what was on them because nobody was even pretending to eat. We were all watching my mother and Charo. My mother sat at the head of the table, Charo on her lap, a bottle in her hand. She kept her face bent close to his, her chin butting the end of the bottle. Charo spit the nipple out once, twice. Each time he spit, Dr. Paulson's hands rose up as if she wanted to push it back in herself. The third time he took it. With a loud, embarrassing smack, he began to eat. He grasped the bottle with his hands, then with both his feet, and drank into the little black plastic bag inside it that held the for formula crumpled in on itself, some prolapsed milky lung. Still, he wouldn't let go until my mother rolled a piece of lettuce up into a cigar and held it to his lips. Then he let the nipple fall out of his mouth and she pulled his empty away. After dinner, Dr. Paulson lingered. It took a few hints to get her to leave. Callie and I got ourselves ready for bed while my mother took care of Charo. After we both changed and brushed our teeth, we walked down the strange new hallway to our parents' room to say goodnight. When Callie and I got to their room, they were already in bed. In the soft glow from the lamp on the nightshade, my father sat propped up on pillows, his glasses off, a book open on his lap. My mother was already curled up beside him for sleep. It was only when we got closer that we saw Charo lying in the space between them. My mother said quickly, this is a one-time thing. <laughs> I leaned over to kiss them, first dad, then mom. Then it was Callie's turn. She leaned forward to kiss my mother, and Charo lifted up one thin finger, swept it hard across her cheek. Callie's, Callie stood up sharply, surprised. It's okay, my mother said. You scared him, that's all. Callie nodded, a little sh shaken, but tried not to show it. The night, she said to Charo, who kept, only kept his finger hooked in the air, a kind of warning. I took Callie's hand, walked her to the bedroom door, then started down the hallway back to her room. We were halfway there when we heard it. First, it sounded like something in a cartoon. Who, 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 I could almost see the cascade of short syllables written in the air above us. Then a wheeze, a very old man laughing, 
and finally a wail, so low, so long. I was sure right then that it was the saddest song in the world. It broke off suddenly, leaving a jagged silence that was somehow worse than crying. It was a relief when, after a few minutes, the wail started up again. Charo had only been pausing for breath. It, it went on so, for so long that Callie and I had turned back to her parents' room. When we got there, all the lights were on. In the glare of the overhead lamp, I saw Charles cling first to my mother's nightgown and then to the sheets of the bed. He arched his back and then flattened himself over and over again. My mother knelt beside him on the bed, her hand at the small of his back, but she couldn't get a hold on him. She was saying, please, sweetie. My father was out of bed. He stood beside my mother, his hands hovering above her shoulders, saying, all right now, but Charles could not be comforted by any of the words they said. 